Melgar in the flesh, looking ready to present in front of the Supreme Court, like like a United States prosecutor <laughs> or something or defense lawyer. Oh, um, thank you. So just nice. For you. It's just for me. <laughs> thank you, and for all the folks who are tuning in. Um, it is such an honor to speak with you, Mirna Mailgar, the former president of the Planning Commissioner, the executive director of Jamestown Community Center, and currently a District 7 supervisorial candidate running for supervisor. You would be the first um, Latin woman to be on the board of the Board of Supervisors, is that correct? Uh, no, actually, we elected a Latina woman, uh, Susan Leal. Oh, Susan Leal, right. 94. The, the first woman to represent D7, right? Yes. First woman in D7, yes. Well, it's about time, I think so. Thank you. Anyway, um, it's so nice to be with you. You're such an incredible, incredible leader in the city. And we were chatting on Facebook Messenger the other day, as we do, um, about, you know, we need to start thinking about the recovery. We need, obviously, there's so much to do right now uh, to, to flatten the curve and to help the most vulnerable among us. Uh, but we need to start thinking about the recovery and how we are going to bounce back from all of this. So I thought, what better person to talk about than someone who has sat at leadership in the nonprofit sector, who has a bunch of employees, who has been at the center of planning San Francisco and our civic life, um, and I now also is currently in, in political and public life. So, you know, the way I, I love to go get right into it and, and kind of split it up into three vectors. One is the small business and the business lens. The other is the personal uh, lens, the employee, people who've lost their job or lost, lost wages. And then talk about the public health lens and how we're gonna bounce back from the public health that lens. That sounds that good. Sound and you know, we may go back and forth a little bit yeah. <laughs> between those three. You know, I um, don't know if I ever told you this, Manny, but the thing about small businesses is really near and dear to my heart. I mean, I worked at Meda supporting small businesses, but, you know, my grandmother was a small businesswoman. Wow. And she had a second grade education in El Salvador. Wow. And uh, she was farmed out when she was a little girl to a family in the country, um, in the city. She was from the country. Uh, and this family was a Palestinian Christian family, immigrants to El Salvador, and they taught her business. Mm -hmm. And that's how she was able to put all of her kids through university, you know, with a second grade education wow. in a third world country. Wow. And you know, the power of small business is that, you know, uh, folks can have income and build their future yeah. uh, it attracts a lot of entrepreneurial folks that don't necessarily you know like going to work for someone else as you know yes. people yes. who are creative <laughs> and have all of that energy all you know and also immigrants yeah. and women Absolutely. people who are starting out in the workforce right Absolutely. and so small businesses employ more people in america than anyone else yes. and so it is crucial you know, that we uh, ground our recovery in the investment for small businesses because of all those reasons. So I see this, this is, there's two, I see this as two boxes. There are the small businesses who were lost in the interim. And we're already seeing that places like Wakanda, places like Slims, um, not just small businesses, large businesses too. We don't know if the W Hotel is gonna reopen, but, um, and I think unfortunately, um, those are gonna be vacant spaces. And so the city is gonna need to do a lot more, um, either to try to bring those businesses back if they can, um, but that's probably unlikely. And I think more, what they can do is, you know, we've been talking about this, how to quickly fill those um, vacancies. And you were on the planning commission, what's something that the city could do to uh, maybe expedite the filling of certain vacant spots that were, of, of businesses that were lost in the uh, shelter in place? So, you know, there's a two things that are going on at the same time and we have to right we have to be able to you know walk and chew gum at the same time right. there is a crisis intervention that um our uh board of supervisors and mayor are working on to get money out fast you know interest-free loans uh, cash um, infusions lines of credit and the federal government is doing that as well um, and then there's the recovery um, and what I would say uh, to all of my ideas around recovery um, is that we need to invest in our infrastructure because before the crisis, our small businesses were already showing uh, signs of right. distress. We've already seen lots of vacancies along commercial corridors. Uh, it's been, there's been a change in the last 10, 15 years, right? In San Francisco and in other right. big cities, 
in the age of Amazon and Uber Eats and um, all of these Grubhub, there's been a, a change in the business plan for a lot of businesses and things going around them. And so what we need to do is while we're recovering to invest in the infrastructure to make those businesses adapt mm -hmm. uh, and be good for the future. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we can do is streamline the um, way that business is open, the way that we support them uh, to make financing easier, especially for people of color and folks that are not having a good time uh, being banked in the regular market right. to uh, look at those issues of equity that we're already making our businesses suffer and address those things now, first. I, I, see, I see there being a logistical issue with uh, with the way money is currently being offered to small businesses. There are limited grants that are, that are being offered locally. No, very, almost no grants being offered federally, although I don't know what's in Nancy's most recent bill, and lots of loans. And the problem is, is uh, for the Small Business Administration, if you want to take a loan of more than $25,000, which I imagine most small businesses that have really been dealt a deep blow by this, so I'm gonna need more than $25,000 to come back. They make you put your personal property as collateral. And oftentimes, you know, no one goes into small business to try to make a lot of money. The margins are really small, especially with brick and mortar, especially with, you know, the restaurant industry. And most people are really nervous about putting their home or their car or, or whatever personal property they have on the line for a business um, that doesn't have really big margins. And so I feel like we need to be more bold and trusting in our small business owners and, and sending them grants and re money that they can directly put into their, to reopening, um, like Australia is doing. Australia is sending $25,000 to, to each small business owner. They're giving it to them because they understand that if they make that short-term investment, small business owners will take that money and immediately use it to stay open, hire their employees back. And I'm just worried that we're thinking too, we're, yeah. we're too debt obsessed. Yeah, I couldn't agree you know? more. I mean, I think that we can be uh, bold, as you say, uh, but also strategic right. and creative. Right. Um, because I think, you know, not all small businesses are created right. equal, right? I mean, I think that from the city's perspective, um, there are neighborhood serving businesses that right. we want right. to see. So there are, you know, in, in the infrastructure of business, there are businesses, you know, downtown and Union Square who serve a purpose, their right. destination, you know, businesses. Right. Whereas, you know, in the, in the neighborhoods, it's, you know, the cobbler shops or, you know, like pl places where people go because it's in their neighborhood. And those businesses right. we need. We need for climate change reasons because we don't people, want people getting in their cars and driving, you know, across town. And so there is a strategic reason why the city should invest in certain kinds of businesses. And immigrant, women-owned business, all those things have a niche in the support of the people of San Francisco. So we could be uh, you know, investing our money, loans, grants, um, interest-free loans, but loans that are payable over a long period of time. All of those things that the market is not already doing is, I think, what our government should do right. uh, to meet our policy goals. Real quick, thank you so much to everyone that's attending. If everyone that's a uh, participant wants to just quickly raise their hand and say hello, there's a little box where you can raise your hand. Hi, everyone. Hello. Thank you for raising your hand. Welcome. We're going to get to questions for Mirna, and we'll have you uh, go ahead and ask questions in the Q&A box uh, in 10 minutes. So if you have questions for Mirna or for me or for each other, just go ahead and add them to the Q&A box. All right. Um, let's, go, let's go to employees, folks who have lost their job. There was a study I saw yesterday that estimated that 125,000 people just in the hotel industry alone in California have lost their jobs. Obviously, the service industry, huge losses, catering, janitorial, um, everything related to physical space, a lot of people have lost their jobs. And, you know, you're seeing, you know, the, what I'm hearing as a small business owner to send to my employees is, you know, beefed up uh, EDD and unemployment benefits, um, folks, things like that. But let's say people have been able to hold on by their fingernails and we've reopened. How do we bring all those folks who've lost their jobs back into the economy and back up to speed. I mean, it's, 
it's a lot of people. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people who, you know, have missed a month or two of work. Right. And this is exactly why we need a recovery plan. Yeah. And we need to start, you know, working on it like now. Yeah. So, uh, you know, hospitality is San Francisco's number one industry. It's yeah. not tech. It's not something else. It's hospitality. And that's because we live in a place that's beautiful and vibrant and everyone wants to come and check. Out. So, um, again, like with uh, small businesses, uh, the hospitality industry was already uh, facing challenges. Right? Our homeless epidemic uh, was getting folks to not, you know, want to have conventions here anymore. Right. Um, yeah. There were, you know, there was already struggle. So uh, in looking at a recovery, how do we set the hospitality industry um, on their way to success? You know, so it's all interrelated. So where what we see in the crisis, is that where we have faced inequality, uh, injustice, um, that's where the cracks have gotten wider. And so our hospitality industry now, like it's decimated. There's the hotels are all empty. The restaurants are shuttering. And so in the recovery, I think we need to invest um, to bring people to, um, and also make sure that the um, things that were uh, presenting challenges before yeah. Uh, we're investing in and solving that those dollars are going to support uh, solutions for homelessness against homelessness to provide affordable housing because we know that that will support our number one industry, which is hospitality. Some people are actually saying that all these vacant hotels might actually and, and kind of things in the Presidio and the emergency declaration might actually allow the city the authority and the space to house a lot of folks who are chronically homeless or homeless, uh, not chronically homeless. And this might actually, in some kind of strange backwards way, allow us to make some real progress on, ho progress on homelessness, which may change the image of the city and make it easier for people to come travel here. What do you think? So maybe. I mean, I think what it shows uh, to me is that we can Right. I think we've been telling each other for years so we can't solve this problem. But look, we actually did. Right. So I don't think that, you know, the solution is going to be to just permanently house the homeless in hotels. But it does show that, you know, if we all come together and decide that this is the investment that we want to do, we can get it done. OK, um, so real quick, I don't know how do I, I don't know exactly how I do a poll, but can people raise their hand if they're participants, if they are an employee that has lost their job? Okay. Or what about someone who knows someone who's lost their job? A lot of people, most people. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So um, let, me just, let me just add, you know, because I'm also the executive director of a nonprofit that employs 203 people. And most shit. of our staff, yeah, it's pretty big. We do after school wow. programs and, you know, summer programs. So we have a lot of hourly and part time workers. And so we have not yet laid anyone off. And my intention is to not lay anyone off. So I'm, you know, trying to figure it all out with our contracts with the school district in the city. But, you know, the government of Denmark just did an amazing thing that they guaranteed the salary of all private sector workers during the, you know, shutdown. And so, you know, we, we could do something similar you and, you know, possible? can we do that? Is that within our, realm? I mean, I think I it's San Francisco, like the reason I, I feel a little bit like, why aren't we being more bold? And apparently I heard that we were not allowed to go into debt as a city. Is that, what is that all about? So we are allowed to go into debt for infrastructure. So, you know, we have, right. <laughs> so what we have, and this is why I'm, I'm talking about a recover as an infrastructure uh, project, because, you know, there are lots of things that we can do to get people back into employment that will also solve the structural issues that we we're already suffering from. So, you know, transportation, our transportation uh, system is totally inadequate for the new economy. It needs to be greener, it needs to be faster, handle more people. For example, mm -hmm. we have... Uh, housing and affordable housing that's also an infrastructure issue education we have seen that when schools are shut down uh, kids have uh, laptops and kids who don't have laptops mm -hmm. and it's you know you can see who has access right so there's uh, the our arts institutions there's lots of things that we could look at in terms of our bonding capacity as a city where we could incur debt and at the same time 
provide jobs for our people, uh, which is what we're going to need to do in the recovery. So the third piece is the public health piece. And this, we were talking in our little pre-call, our pre-kiki that we were doing before this, which translation is like a, a pre-kiki is like, a kiki is like a party. Do you know what a pre-kiki is? <laughs> okay, so it's a pre-party basically. We were having a pre-party before this. So in our little pre-party that we were doing, we were talking about how much we miss physical contact and that there's going to be this, after this is all done, just like a big, party kind of atmosphere in the city, almost like a summer of love. I interviewed uh, the drag queen Heclina yesterday and she talked about a renaissance that happened after the AIDS epidemic actually yeah. in the queer community. So that's amazing. And I think that's definitely gonna happen. Um, and I'm looking forward to that moment. I will be on the front of that line. I'll be in the middle of that party. <laughs> and at the same time, if what we're hearing is true, there will be a lot of suffering in our city that we're gonna see over the next month, 45 days potentially, and I hope not, and God forbid, there will be deaths, maybe deaths of people that we know. And so I feel like there's just been this strange like mourning period and also celebration that happens after we've all woken up from this last couple of weeks and months. And how do, we, how do we move through that, Mirna? So we move through it by relying on each other. You know, I think that what makes us unique as a city is that you know we reinvent ourselves yeah. after crises. We've done it over and over again. And the other thing that has set us apart as a city is that we've always done it with a progressive lens, you know, rooted in social justice values. And we have always struggled with this because there's been inequity in our city. We've uh, we've had a history of racism, of misogyny, of um, you know. Uh, discrimination against the LGBTQ community. It has happened all. And yet we've been able to reinvent ourselves and address those issues. And that's what I think we will do again at this time. So, you know, to your question about our healthcare system, I think that uh, one of the foundational things that we need to address is actually housing for healthcare. You know, uh, housing is a driver of health outcomes. So it's not a clinical treatment, it's a preventative treatment that if you have sta stable, safe, affordable housing, you are so much more likely to live longer, to be healthier, to not need as much, you know, investment, a general hospital in right. the emergency room, which is right. incredibly expensive. Right. And so it is our opportunity to figure this out, to have a, a, a housing infrastructure that is equitable, that will then lead to better health outcomes for everyone and prevent the pandemic you know, outcomes that we're going through now where we are having to scramble to get people under a roof right. so that right. they don't infect everyone else. Right. So we, we've got two minutes until the Q&A. My friends who are participating, if you have a question for Mirna, um, mainly Mirna, but I guess for me too, but mainly Mirna, feel free to type it into the Q&A box. Also, if you have an idea, if you have an idea about how we can come back and rebound and restore from this, please write that in as well. Mirna Melgar may very well be uh, one of the supervisors who's going to be in power during the recovery in D7. Um, she would be fabulous uh, if she were in that seat. And so she may be one of the people that's actually going to be architecting this recovery. So if you have an idea, please ask it. And that, that gets to my last question, which is, you were the president of the Planning Commission. You were, for, for a while, and you were on the Planning Commission for a long time, you were sitting in the midst of uh, planning conversations around the city. How do you think we plan after this? I mean, how do we re re physically rebuild and how do we change the way we rebuild after over a month, maybe weeks, months of a complete economic standstill? Yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, there are things that we have been planning about, you know, for example, the climate crisis. You know, we, uh, our entire transportation infrastructure is underground, you know, right. and a lot of our uh, downtown and financial district is right at sea level, close right. to the water. So right. we have been uh, planning for a while, what are we going to do? What mitigation measures do we need to, you know, deal with this new reality? I think that what's happened is, right, is that we're going to need to fast track a bunch of that stuff you know, uh, both to create jobs um, and to, because we need to, we need to deal with these issues. Um, so we have a notoriously slow planning process uh, in San Francisco. Um, 
part of it is great because it gives people a voice. And I think that that is important when you live in seven by seven square miles that, you know, we need to understand what people think about stuff. But there's lots of other things that are just not as necessary. The lack of coordination between agencies or, you know, uh, compliance requirements that contradict from one agency to another. So I do think that we can do things faster and more efficiently, and we're going to need to in order to get ourselves out of this pickle. You know, one thing people are saying is that folks are working together now more than they ever have before. We're a famously divided city in many ways. You know, lots of factions, lots of tribes. Um, and I saw it too. I was at the press conference that the mayor held uh, in Chinatown with the Board of Supervisors announcing the first round of support for small businesses. And it was beautiful to see everyone together. And I really hope that we keep this unity uh, into the recovery and that we all hold hands and, and, and do what's best for San Francisco because, um, and that, that's one of the strange benefits of uh, a trial and tribulation is it brings people together. All right, we have some, we have some ideas and questions. So from Christoph Did Didrikson, um, just an idea of temporary closing streets for outdoor recreation um, and more space to walk, bike while social distancing. Um, is an idea. Are you concerned by what you're seeing on the streets? Some people are saying, you know, we're not following social distancing enough. Um, what are you feeling? Uh, are you asking me, man? Yeah, yeah, I'm asking you. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, you know, I haven't actually seen that, you know. So yeah. in, um, in the boonies. Yeah, I'm in the boonies. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so folks, you know, I actually went shopping at my neighborhood store on Ocean Avenue, and people were wearing masks and wow. uh, gloves, you know, wow. and uh, very mindful of other space. Wow. Um, so, uh, you know, that was that was great. Uh, yeah. I haven't seen folks, you know, flagrantly violating the six. Yeah. but rule but i i've seen it on yeah. tv you I know uh, and, and it had, is... um, has like tickers where they're only letting a certain amount of people into virate at a time and then you have to wait outside in line six feet away from each other and you know isn't that great because i don't think they're legally required to do that small businesses it's not on them to enforce right. it but yet i have seen it in all the small businesses that are open in my neighborhood right. it shows that they really care all right theo gordon the five-year city budget was already looking dire before this crisis yes i know this i was on the small business commission and we had to like all city departments had to plan for a one percent and then the three percent budget cut over the next couple of years just to keep the budget uh, to, to deal with the budget uh, deficit. The city economist said that it's going to get worse because of Prop E, and now this is going to blow a hole in the budget. How do we reform how the city spends its money and what we spend it on so that we can have the money we need for healthcare and recovery? This is such a good question, Theo. It is. Hi, Theo. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I there's two different things, right? There is the annual city budget that goes to this services from the city and also the services that nonprofits provide for the city. Yeah. And then there is the capital budget. It's like what we borrow, basically. Uh, the, our, we use our bond, bonding capacity and our excellent money to build um, you know, stuff that we need as infrastructure, sewer system, water, and all those things. And so I think it's an excellent idea to actually look at that bonding capacity, to invest in our infrastructure, to do some of the recovery things that we need done, create jobs, let people borrow money, uh, because those are infrastructure issues that we need going into the future. Got it. We have a bunch of questions. So Jen's got a question. Do you think it'll be feasible to incorporate sustainability and resiliency and energy efficiency requirements with the capital that government gives out as the economy gets rebuilt? Or will immediately or will the immediate recovery be the only concern? That's such a great question, right? Can we, can we, I hate to use this reference because it's so violent, but can we kill a couple of birds with one stone? I think we have to. Uh, and in fact, you know, I think that we must, right, uh, to deal with a climate crisis, but also to train our workforce. So if we um, are going towards a green new economy, right. we must train folks to know how to do those things, how to install solar panels, how to do energy efficient, you know, things in a home. So um, it should be actually a requirement to do it, you know, to get free money or, or cheap money. You were saying this in our pre-Kiki that we, we have one shot. I mean, we've got a shot to do this. 
Um, we're not, I mean, we need to utilize this as best we can. And I'm really proud that Nancy Pelosi, our Congresswoman, the speaker, basically said, no, we're gonna do this right. We're gonna really help the average American. We're gonna invest properly. Um, I'm so proud of her. And, you know, we were talking about this earlier before we started that, you know, if we look back during uh, the Great Depression, uh, that's exactly what we did. And we ended up with the best, you know, transportation infrastructure system. Our, our system of roads was built then. All the WPA murals that, you know, adorn all these civic buildings around town came from that investment. Now, that investment was adequate for 100 years ago. It's no longer adequate today. So how do we invest this money for our transportation infrastructure of tomorrow? How do we get those, you know, green new economy things implemented to have an adequate public transportation infrastructure and also like uh, climate crisis dealing tools? Right. Well, we're supposed to have the infrastructure president. What happened to that? <laughs> It's supposed to be the president. It's not for the investing infrastructure. Yeah. All right, Martina's got a question. What is your vision for bringing together agencies to serve families and streamline essential essential service delivery to families? Great question for you, running a two hundred person organization that helps families. So we already have a really good infrastructure uh, around the city of uh, nonprofits that serve families around the city, and we have incredibly rich. Uh, infrastructure that's culturally competent, that has language capacity, that already has a relationship with people. So, Now, when we lift the shelter in place order, the city has to make sure that we support these agencies. So, at the other end of the tunnel, we'll get our families. Got it. Next question is John. Now that we're before being forced to change our habits, <laughs> do you think this is a good time to make the changes we need to make to make to adapt to climate change? We've kind of already talked about this a little bit, but you know, people are there are reports that there are. Uh, dolphins in the <laughs> Venice canals for the first time in 60 years. There's no smog above Los Angeles. I kind of feel like in a strange universal way that other nature is fighting back against um, all of our destruction with this. You know, it's a naturally born virus and uh, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I feel like there's, there's something happening in the universe right now and uh, wondering if maybe we can actually, what do you think we can learn from this and how we change our habits to make the world better as a result of this? Do you think that's going to happen? Yeah, I mean, I think some, it's uh, certainly prompted some of us to rethink the way we live and, you know, whether or not we really need to do the things that we've always taken for granted. Uh, but in terms of, you know, rebuilding and looking at our infrastructure, there's this idea in urban planning about like the 15 minute neighborhood, right? That when you live in an urban setting, you should be able to walk within 15 minutes and so as we're planning for business recovery and you know our infrastructure I, keeping that in mind i think is really important 15 minutes and have what they need right do you think people are actually going to change i mean i feel like we're all changing our behavior because we have to Right, like I actually went through my credit card bill re this morning and I was like, wow, I'm spending a lot less on yeah. things and I'm putting gas in my Vespa and, you know, I'm consuming a lot less. Um, and, you know, we're, I think it's a temporary thing, but do you think that we're actually going to change our habits in the way we consume and move about the world as a result of this flying less? Yeah, we wonder if it's going to stick. I tell you something. So, you know, my uh, grandmother who passed away in April, the one I was telling you about, <laughs> the small business woman. So she, she came of age right during the Great Depression mm -hmm. and her habits were definitely depression habits. She used a lot less. She reused stuff. You know, that's kind of how she was trained. And it may not have happen for all of us but I do think that there are folks for whom this moment is going to be just sort of life-changing you know um, and you know that may not be a bad thing right I mean my generation 
Oh, goodness gracious. When I was 11, 9-11 happened. And mm -hmm. then we had the, we had the longest war in American history. And then when I graduated college was when the first recession hit. And I just opened my first small business a year and a half ago during the worst wildfires in California history and now a pandemic. And I, I almost feel like my generation's cursed a little bit, the millennials. You know, we had a little bit of the 90s, which was nice. And now it's just like, God, as soon as we think we're up, we're down. Um, and at the same time, I do think it's going to make us stronger. Um, it's going to make us more resilient. And actually, I don't know how you feel about this, and I think this is a good place to end. Um, you know, San Francisco, people have bemoaned. Since I only moved here seven and a half years ago, but everyone is bemoaning the loss of San Francisco soul, the San Francisco of old. I think what it comes down to is people feeling like the sense of community and unity and togetherness that may have been precipitated by the summer of love or the, the fact that San Francisco was more cohesive before was lost by a lot of folks coming here to make money as their main, um, their main kind of thing. But this is an experience that is bonding all of us, not just in San Francisco, but around the country. Do you think that this, do you think that we're about to enter a new stage of San Francisco's culture and feeling? I do. I really do. Uh, let me just say that I am an optimist. You know, I always see uh, what could be. I have three and um, I think they've got stuff figured out earlier than my generation did, or even your generation. You know, I think uh, that I work with youth because I believe in the future. Yeah. You know, and I think that youth are incredibly resilient and they are adapting and developing new ways of being. Um, in San Francisco, though, has always been about the hustle. There's never been a time when we haven't been, you know, investing, making money, figuring things out since 1849 when they discovered gold. Right. So um, folks are coming here and they're creating new wealth. Um, and you know, they, you know, they're adapting to who we are and we're adapting to them. Um, but I think we're going to figure it out um, because we do have a strong soul that will propel us into the future together with progressive values. And our future is bright. I do think that. Well, Myrna Melgar, the uh, executive director of the Jamestown Community Center um, and currently a District 7 supervisorial candidate. Thank you so much for everyone that attended. Thank you for being here. Thank you for tuning in at three o'clock on a weekday. Um, Manny's is closed and we need your help to keep it open, allow us to reopen uh, it, when, when all this is said and done. And so I've changed my background with the link to donate. It's joinit.org slash O slash Manny's. You will get it in an email tonight as well. Please become a sponsor. It's $36 a month. It's a dollar a day. And that money is going to go directly to our programming to allow us to keep doing stuff just like this for the community. Joinit.org slash O slash Manny's. Mirna Melgar, what is your website for your uh, supervisorial race? It's mirnamelgar.com. Mirnamelgar.com, District 7. Thank you, everyone, so much. Please tag us at Welcome to Manny's. That's at Welcome to Manny's. And Mirna Melgar is at Mirna Melgar 4D7. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Later. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Woop, 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 woop,